personally get to know you. We only have a couple of announcements to start off with, and the first one is uh, just another reminder that Jace Ellis is starting a college and career. church for honoring them with blessing them with the meals and the service that our church family has provided for that ministry uh, there's going to be a church-wide fellowship immediately following this service today uh, celebrate recovery will be providing meals for everybody so uh, plan to attend and uh, be blessed by celebrate recovery I think that's all the announcements today so let's go ahead and stand and greet one another and our guests this morning As we get started today, I just want to read a little scripture to you. Second Peter, verse one and uh, chapter one, verse four. You can keep going with the drum beat, brother. Don't worry about stopping. Second Peter one four says this: Because of his glory and excellence, he has given he he has given us great and precious promises, ones that enable us to share his divine nature and escape the world's corruption. You know how amazing is the promise of salvation to those who believe in him hope of eternal security for those who love God amen that's what we're celebrating today that we're standing on the promises of God and just a real quick reminder we're gonna be doing the offering again as we did last week Standing on the promises of Christ my King Through eternal ages let His praises ring Glory in the highest I will shout and see Standing on the promises of God We're standing, standing Standing on the promises of God my Savior, stand standing, we're standing on the promises of God, standing on, standing on the promises that cannot fail, when the howling storms of doubt and fear assail. By the living word of God I shall prevail Standing on the promises of God We're standing, standing Standing on the promises of God my Savior Standing, standing I'm standing on On the promises I cannot fall Listening every moment to the Spirit's call Resting in my Savior as my all in all Standing on the promises of God We are standing, standing Standing on the promises of God Savior, standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God, sing that again, we're standing. 
8 it says God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners Christ died for us Paul talks he, he writes about this same love further on in his letter to the Romans in chapter 8 that neither life nor death angels nor rulers things present nor things to come nor powers height nor depth or anything in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God and Jesus see today we're celebrating the promises that we have in Christ Jesus we're celebrating the cross and what that means to us we've got a drama a little bit later and I hope that you can see from the sufferings of Christ the love that he has for those who are called according to his purpose I hope you know that God loves you today if you believe in him you're saved got the promise of salvation and what a great thing that is and sometimes we forget that that's what we come and sing about we sing praises to the God who loved us first so I just want to remind you that today that's why 
we sing to the Lord. That's why we sing and celebrate His love for us. But also we celebrate by singing that we love Him. And that's what we're going to do in a second. We're just going to say, oh, how we love Him, how we love Him. I'm going to ask that if you would, just lift your hands to Jesus this morning. Lift your hands to Jesus just for a brief second. I want you to think about the cross that Jesus carried about the weight of sin that Jesus bore on Golgotha that day. Our sin, our mistakes, us missing the mark. I want you to lift your hands and, and in your heart say, Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I praise you. God, you're worth everything. You're worth my life, my heart, my soul, my time, my focus, my devotion, my passion. Jesus, you are first. Praise you, Jesus. Oh, how we love him. Sing it to him. Yeah, we love him. Oh, how we love him. Oh, how we love him. Oh, how we love. Sing that again. Yeah, we love him. Oh. in this praise may you be glorified in this time that we lift your name up high you are our God we proclaim it this morning you are our healer our savior our intercessor for our sins we love you your grace is enough more than I need at your word I will believe I wait for you draw near again let your spirit make me new and I will fall at your feet I will fall at your feet and I will in me your presence in me Jesus like the way by the power of your word I am restored I am redeemed by your spirit I am free and I will fall at your feet. I will fall at your feet. And I will worship you here. Alright, sing freely you gave. Freely you gave it all for us. Surrendered your life. Upon that cross, great is the love poured out for all. This is our God, and lifted on high from death to life, forever our God is glorified. Serving.
Walking on the road to Jerusalem The time had come to sacrifice again My two small sons, they walked beside me on the road The reason that they came was to watch the land Daddy, Daddy, what will we see there? There's so much that we don't understand. So I told them of Moses and Father Abraham. And then I said, dear children, watch the land. There will be so many in Jerusalem today. We must be sure the Lamb doesn't run away. So I told them of Moses and Father Abraham. And then I said, Dear children, watch the Lamb. When we reached the city, I knew something must be wrong. There were no joyful worshipers, no joyful worship songs. I stood there with my children in the midst of angry men. And then I heard a crowd cry out, Crucify him. We tried to leave the city, but we could not get away. Forced to play in this drama, a part I did not wish to play. Why upon this day were men condemned to die? Why are we standing here where soon they will pass by? I looked and I said, even now they come. The first one cried for mercy. The people gave him none. The second one was violent. He was arrogant and loud. I can still hear his angry voice screaming at the crowd. Then someone said, there's Jesus. I scarce believe my eyes. A man so badly beaten, he barely looked alive. Blood poured from his body, from the thorns upon his brow. Running down the cross and falling to the ground. I watched him as he struggled. I watched him as he fell. The cross came down upon his back. The crowd began to yell. In that moment, I felt such agony. In that moment, I felt such loss. Then a Roman soldier grabbed my arm and screamed, You carry his cross. At first, I tried to resist him. Then his hand reached for his sword. So I knelt and took the cross from my Lord. I placed it on my shoulder, started down the street. The blood that he was shedding was running down my cheek. They led us to Golgotha 
They drove nails deep in his feet and hands. In a quiet voice, I heard him pray, Father, forgive them. Oh, never had I seen such love in any other eyes. Into thy hands I commit my spirit. He prayed, then he died. I stood for what seemed like years. I had lost all sense of time. Then I felt two tiny hands holding tight to mine. My children stood there weeping. I heard the oldest say, Father, please forgive us, the Lamb ran away. Daddy, Daddy, what have we seen here? There's so much that we don't understand. I took them in my arms We turned and faced the cross And I said, dear children Watch The Lamb Father, we thank you for, for this place where we can come to, to freely worship you. I thank you. Thank you for this visual representation of, of what you have done for us to bring us from separation from you, God, to save us from our sin, to save us from an eternity without you. We thank you for sending Christ to die for us in our place even though we didn't deserve it and I pray that as we go into this time that you would begin to soften hearts to the gospel that that your word would pierce hearts and callous minds and begin healing people in this room I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm not preaching from a specific passage of Scripture, which kind of uh, goes against my rule for myself. I like to preach through passages and explain what's being said. This is, this is a little bit broader of a sermon. But I do have a request, since I know a lot of you like to doodle when you feel the words that are being said aren't important enough to write down. So I'd like to ask that in your doodling today that you would take note of what's being said. Uh, there is going to be some imagery that comes out over the course of this sermon, and I think it'd be neat to see what y'all uh, have to draw about it. So feel free to take notes, feel free to doodle, uh, but be intentional with your doodling. That's a funny word, isn't it? Anyway... In Ephesians chapter 4, verses, verses, just one verse, verse 32, Paul writes to the church in Ephesus, and he says, Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. So as Christians, we're commanded to forgive one another. We know that. But we're commanded to forgive freely, right? We're not expected 
to receive something for our forgiveness. In fact, if we receive something for forgiveness, then uh, it's not really forgiveness. You can't pay somebody to forgive you because then it's not truly forgiveness. But if we're commanded to forgive so freely, then the question that many people have, that I myself have had, is why did Jesus have to die on the cross in order that we be forgiven for our sins? In other words, why didn't God look down from heaven and say, all is forgiven, everything is good, I forgive you, I pardon you, and then go on to his next order of business? So the question brings me to the title of this sermon, and that is, why the cross? Why the cross? When we ask why the cross, the first point that we come to is that God's perfect justice required a sacrifice, the cross of Christ. God's perfect justice required a sacrifice, the cross of Christ. When we think about God's perfect justice, the first thing that we need to understand is that God, being the creator of all, being the origin of all, is the origin of justice, the origin of morality, the origin of holiness and purity and all that is true and right. Whenever he was giving his law to his people, Israel, he said these words in Leviticus 19, 35 through 37, you shall do no wrong in judgment in measure of length or weight or quantity. You shall have just balances, just weights, a just epha, a just hin. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and you shall observe all of my statutes and all of my rules and you shall do them. I am the Lord. Proverbs 16:11 says, a just balance and scales are the Lord's. All the weights in the bag are his work. So allow me to begin working through this first point, the fact that God's perfect justice requires a sacrifice. He's the creator and sustainer of all. Man is fully capable of sinning against God without sinning against man, but we are incapable of sinning against man without sinning against God. The point that I'm making is that all of our sin, all of the things that we do wrong, the thoughts, the words, even the feelings at times, all of these sins are against God, even if we feel that they're only focused on one person or one group of people. All sin is against God. In the Old Testament, we, uh, we often see imagery of the scale, as was mentioned in Leviticus and in Proverbs. And whenever we think of this scale, this balance, we think of the law. But what it brings many of us to when it comes to ourselves is that God is balancing our just deeds and our unjust deeds. And as long as we're balanced, when, we're die, when we die, we're good to go. We have this idea that God sees the good that we do and he sees the bad. When we do something bad, we have to do something good to undo it. Well, there is no control Z in life. Some of you get that. You can't undo the wrong that you have done. The fact is that we are not being weighed based on our good versus our bad. When we are being judged by God, it is all of me being judged against all of God. So imagine on one side of the scale you have the holiness and the perfection of God, and then you have you or me. This is the scale. This is the judgment. So imagine then all your holiness is right here, and every time you sin, a measure of that holiness is taken off the scale throwing it more and more out of balance. And when you do manage to do something good, something right, you're not putting holiness back on the scale because when we do good, when we do right, we're only doing what God expects and commands of us to begin with. We can't 
put righteousness back on the scale. We can't tip the balance of God's scales. So my miserably failed attempt at holiness is weighed against the perfect holiness of God. At creation, the scales were balanced, and then sin entered the world, and the balances were no longer in man's favor. Sin displaced holiness. It displaced purity. It took its place on the scale and began to displace the things that God has called us to. And the scale started to tip. And holiness, as we said, can't be added back to the scale. So we see here that the Old Testament law, the law that God put in place for his people to follow in order to be holy, that law showed man that they were incapable of attaining the holiness to which they had been called. In the Old Testament, we have an image of the, of the sacrificial system. We know that they would, bring, they would bring animals to sacrifice at the temple. They would bring sheep or ox or, or whatever they had to sacrifice. They'd bring it. In fact, I heard that uh, in some traditions, the way that it worked is the children would go and they would have a conversation with the patriarch of their family. So like for me, I would go and I would talk to my grandpa, who was the head of my entire family. And I would talk to him about my sin, and I would explain to him what I had done, how I had sinned against God. And he would help me come up with the proper sacrifice for what I had done. And so I might require a lamb or a turtle dove if I was pretty good, you know. But I often wonder what it must have been like taking those trips up to Jerusalem to bring these sacrifices to the Lord. Like, here I am walking down the path, and I look at Matt, and he's over here leading a little lamb or carrying a little turtle dove, and here I'm lugging two oxen behind me because I really messed up. Like, I bet it was shameful at times to bring these sacrifices to the Lord, but these sacrifices were blood sacrifices. They were, they were meant to atone for the sin that had been committed by the individual. The only issue is that these sacrifices were really only symbolic. They were only temporary because they would only forgive you of the sin that you had committed. It had nothing to do with the, the, the malice you harbored in your heart or with the sin that you were going to commit. It was only right now at this time. There was no permanent fix to sin. And so once again, the law only pointed out how sinful man was. Now because our model for life is perfection, because the law tells us that perfection is what God requires. The sacrifice had to be perfect. So, in conversations I've had with Muslims, I've spent time in in Saudi Arabia and in Jordan and uh, even in London working directly with Muslims, having conversations with Muslims. Uh, that was my purpose in going to these places. One of the biggest points of contention that we run into in our conversation is I'm trying to share the gospel with them. I'm trying to point them to Christ. Why did Christ have to die on the cross? Trying to point them to the life-giving sacrifice of Christ. And their response is, Jesus didn't die on the cross. In fact, God placed a man to look like Jesus up on the cross, but he saved Jesus. See, Muslims believe in Jesus, but he's just a prophet. I mean, he's a big deal, but he's just a prophet. He's not the son of God. He certainly isn't God. But the Muslims have this idea that God is merciful and God is good, and that God can simply forgive us out of the goodness of his heart. They believe that God can do anything including forgiving for the sake of forgiving. But because our model for life, as we talked about, is perfection, and we are imperfect, we can't tip the, tip the balance of the scales. And neither can God simply tip the balance of the scale, simply forgive us out of the goodness of his heart without compromising the integrity of his perfect justice. This is a hard one for us to swallow because God can do everything. God is almighty. But let me tell you, this is something that we need to be grateful for. This is something that we need to celebrate. 
that God will not do anything that compromises his character. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the fact that he had to have an atoning sacrifice to maintain his perfect justice, and the fact that he sent Christ as that sacrifice, that points to the consistent character of God. And because we are imperfect, and because God requires perfect, he required a perfect sacrifice, one that man is incapable of providing. When Christ, the perfect sacrifice, died on the cross, he became our holiness. And in the New Testament, it says that he became sin. So on the cross, he absorbed all of the sin that we commit, that we have committed, that we're in the process of committing, that we will commit. He absorbed all this. He became sin. This perfect man became sin. And when he died on the cross, and his blood was spilled, that sacrificial blood, the sin was covered. Our sin was covered. And so when our sin was covered by Christ, Christ became our holiness, and he was then placed on the scale in our place. The holiness of Christ cannot be tainted by the sin of man. When the holiness of Christ is placed on the scales of a perfectly just God, and is weighed against the holiness of God. It's perfectly balanced. And the holiness of Christ is impenetrable. It can't be undone. The scales are eternally in our favor because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And right before Jesus died on the cross, what were the words that he said? He said, it is finished. It is finished. The law was fulfilled. God's wrath was satisfied. And our sins were atoned for. It truly was finished. So then going back to our forgiving others, when we forgive others freely, we can only do it because God ultimately forgave us through Christ. We are able to forgive ourselves because that ultimately means accepting the forgiveness God has given us through Christ. Going back to Ephesians 4.32, Paul says, Be kind to one another tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you, as God in Christ forgave you. Remember, all sin is ultimately against God, so that, when, so that whenever we forgive others, we're pointing them to the forgiveness that God has already given them, and we're acting in obedience to God's will. So this completes the perfect justice of God. God created a perfect world. Sin broke the perfect world. God in his perfect justice sent the atoning sacrifice that would complete his justice. We deserved the cross. But not only did we deserve the cross, we earned it. Look at it that way. The wages of sin is death. Our wages for sinning, what we receive for sinning, is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. The cross demonstrates the truth that God's holiness and his love for us are equal. They are equally in infinite. Now this brings to mind a poem, this whole, this whole fact that, that we deserved separation from God. Those of us who aren't in Christ, we're, we're living for ourselves, we're living f for our own desires. We're doing what we want to do, and we're rejecting Christ. And when you die in that state, when you cease to breathe in the state of rejecting Christ, you go into eternity without Christ. The decision was made here in life to go into eternity without Christ. And we know what that eternity looks like. The hell that's to follow, the separation from God, the weeping and the gnashing of teeth, as the New Testament puts it. But these thoughts bring me to, to the, the image of of the thief on the cross next to Jesus. 
and his simple question, you know, Father, will remember me when you enter paradise. This is an excerpt from the poem by John Piper. It says, The thief, his vicious mouth was still, and something deep within his will, begotten by the quiet prayer of his reputed king, was there as new and strange to wickedness as orchards in the wilderness. And from his lips there came a word that none from him had ever heard. He turned his head so he could see, saying, Jesus, is there hope for me? At first, the thief feared the Lord was dead. But then Christ lifted up his head to see the fruit of his travail and softly spoke around the nail. Today with me in paradise, you'll stand beside the reigning Christ. And when the thief heard the Savior die, he gave an agonizing cry. My God, my God, how can this be? Why have you not forsaken me. We have a lot in common with this thief. No matter how reputable you are, no matter how good you are, no matter how the community looks at you, the fact is that apart from Christ, you are a prisoner to your sin. Apart from Christ, you have no hope. You're helpless and hopeless. Just like that thief was hanging up there on the cross. But God demonstrates his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And this completed his perfect justice. Which brings us to point number two. God's perfect sacrifice compels us to obedience. Our cross. God's perfect sacrifice compels us to obedience. Our cross. Mark 8, 34 through 38 says, And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, this is Jesus speaking, he said, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me, for whoever would save his life must lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. I find it interesting that these are the words of Jesus before he died on the cross. Think back to this, to this time period. We all know someone, or we have one ourselves. I have one in my office. This section of wall, or in some cases, maybe an entire wall dedicated to all of your crosses that you decorate your house with. In this time, no one in their right mind decorated their house with a cross. It'd be kind of like us decorating our home with a guillotine or a, uh, an electric chair model. It just, they didn't. Because in this, in this day, when Jesus was saying these words, he was speaking of a well-known device that was used for torture unto death. It was one of the worst methods of execution in this time, probably ever. And in contrast, Jesus was a sinless man. Jesus was perfect. So let's, let's, let's contrast these two things. We have this perfect man. Jesus Christ. And he's dying in the cruelest way possible. Contrast the holiness and the purity of Christ with the evil of man that could come up with such a device as the cross. Holiness and evil. And just days after saying the words, pick up your cross and follow me, Jesus picked up his cross and walked the road to Calvary. And he died on his cross. And he did this willingly and not begrudgingly. When we confess Jesus as Lord and believe that God raised him from the dead, we will die to ourselves. We will pick up our crosses. 
but this is a personal check time for each of us in this room, and I have to do this regularly. If we claim to be Christians but are living for self, then it's likely that we never truly confessed Christ and we never picked up our crosses. I would venture so far as to say that there are people in this room who think that they're following Christ, but they're not. That's a scary thought. Now, going back to this text and thinking about this call to carry your cross, have you ever thought about what the people listening to this teaching may have thought? I bet, I bet these words really hit these people hard when they first heard it because he's like, whoa, pick up your cross. Jesus, that's kind of a big deal because a cross is like the ultimate tool of suffering and death, and you're telling me to pick it up and carry it? But I bet this word, these words hit them even harder as they were thinking about them on the day they watched Christ do just what he had told them to do days earlier. See, Jesus' command for us to carry our cross came before he ever carried his. And it became real in that moment, I bet, for those people. Just to think about it. I bet they were like, oh, so that's what he meant. Yet, the movement still went forward. Christianity grew. Why? Because it's so real. These people, they saw what Jesus was teaching. They heard what he was preaching. They understood the law. And when he came and fulfilled the law, and they realized their sins were truly forgiven, they no longer had to bring sacrifices in the hope that it worked. Their eternity was set in Christ. In Ephesians chapter 1, Paul says that they were sealed in the Holy Spirit. Sealed. Meaning that, that when Christ is on the balance in our place. He cannot be moved. The balance is eternally in our favor. Those of us who are in Christ. Those of us who have been called, who have been saved by the blood of Christ. They knew it was real, and so in, the, in spite of the fact that they watched their Savior die on that cross, and three days later resurrect, in spite of the fact that they knew that the calling on their life was very similar to the life that Jesus himself had lived, they wanted to be obedient to that calling, even if it meant death, even if it meant gruesome death. In the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve literally walked with and talked with God. When sin entered through the serpent, through the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and through the choice of man to eat of the forbidden fruit, there was an immediate void created between God and man. Adam and Eve would never again walk and talk with God in the same way that they had in the garden. That sin separated them. But the death of Christ restored that former glory to us. Through Christ, we can have communion with God. Our sin is now displaced by holiness the holiness of Christ. And we can walk and talk to God and we can trust that he will always be with us. The difference now is that we still struggle with sin. Adam and Eve, they lived in a sinless place where they walked with and talked with God. Here on earth, we, our lot in life is to struggle with this sin that we deal with on a regular basis, but to faithfully follow the Lord, trusting that he has saved us from this sin. So when Christ died on the cross, he satisfied the just wrath of God in order that, he would not be, that we would not be forsaken. God redeemed us through Christ. In the temple, this is an interesting thought to kind of bring all this together. In the, in the temple, there was a massive veil. A lot of you have heard of this veil. It separated the, the place of worship from the Holy of Holies. Now, inside the Holy of Holies, the priest would go in and he would be in direct contact with God. The priest would intercede on behalf of the people. The priest was the only one who could go into this place because he was the intercessor. And so, so this veil brought, allowed him to go in and be separated from the people, but to be in the presence of God. When Jesus died on the cross, Scripture says that the veil was torn. The Holy of Holies was exposed. In the New Testament, it goes on to talk about how those of us who are in Christ, we have been called to and placed in a holy priesthood. What does that mean? That means that believers have a direct line 
to God. We are in the presence of God at any given time. We have communication with God. It's open to us because of Christ. Now, this veil, it's really interesting to think about, was like 12 to 18 inches thick. It wasn't like a curtain, like a little sheet hanging down from the ceiling. It was, it was really, really tall, really, really wide, and really, really thick. So the fact that it was torn is huge. But it's a lot more than mere symbolism of a returning to communion with God for us of a restoration of us. The tearing of the veil is the effect of the reality that we have been restored in Christ, brought back to a place where we can walk with God and talk with God and be in the presence of God. Now thinking back on on all that's been said, talking about the, the perfect justice of God and how it demands a sacrifice, which is why Christ had to die. That's why the cross took place, because God's perfect justice required it. And then thinking about carrying our cross, following Christ, rejecting ourselves, removing ourselves from our will and following after him. We're only able to do that through the salvation of Christ. Now thinking about that, I'm going to read Hebrews 2, 2 through 3, which says, For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Those of us in this room, we've heard the gospel. It's been made clear. There is no hope for anyone apart from Christ. This salvation is the only way to God. How shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? The fact of the matter is that not all will profess Christ as Lord. Apart from Christ, there is no salvation. So it's my prayer that those of you in this room who have up until this point rejected the gospel, have up until this point rejected Christ. It's my prayer that God will begin to soften your hearts, the Holy Spirit will begin to work in your life to reveal this truth to you, that you will be saved. Because nothing that I can say or do and nothing that I can pray will save you. It's only through the work of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit in your life that you can even accept these truths and be saved. So the invitation is this. I'm going to be standing up here, and I want you to feel free to come down and and talk to me. If you feel the Lord leading you to pick up your cross and follow him, come talk to me. If you feel the Lord working in other ways, feel free to pray at the altar. Come kneel down here or stay in your seat and pray. Because the, the fact is that God doesn't will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So this is your invitation. Let's pray and then we'll open the altar for you. Father, we thank you for your truth and for your word. We thank you for allowing us to stand here and to worship you in song and to worship you through the the reading and the hearing of your word. God, I pray for, for the people in this room who who know you, that you would continue to give them the strength and the will to carry their crosses daily and follow you in full obedience. And Father, I know that you will bless them for it and that you already have, and I praise you for that. And I praise you for the encouragement that those people are to me and to the leadership here. Father, I pray for those who don't know you in this room, God, that you would begin to work in their hearts, soften their hearts. Father, that that, that today would be the day of your salvation for them, that they would have their eyes open to the light of your gospel, that they would be saved. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.